I welcome everyone here this morning. It's so good to see all of our members. We've got several visitors with us, and we're thankful that you're here this morning as we gather together on this Lord's Day. It also happens to be Mother's Day. It's a day that has been set aside in our society, as is our custom, to celebrate and honor our mothers. Those individuals, as Doug mentioned, who uh, helped raise us or some other uh, woman in our lives who may have helped raise us, our grandmother, our aunt, whoever it may be, that has meant a great deal to us, that has helped us in our path in this life, especially those who are Christians who have helped us to understand God's will. As Doug mentioned in his prayer, we recognize that God gives us these great examples, both in our, our fathers, our mothers, our grandparents, these individuals who help raise us are given to us, and they are a blessing uh, to raise us in the way that we should go. And so given that fact, I'd like to study a little bit this morning about lessons we can learn from a woman named Hannah. In 1 Samuel chapter 1 and chapter 2, these are the only chapters that contain mention of Hannah, who is Samuel's mother. We have record of Hannah, and what little we have helps us to understand a little bit about the example uh, or the character that Hannah had. And from her character, we can gain certain lessons and examples from it. So consider with me, starting in verse 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to stay here in 1 Samuel 1 and 2 this morning. It says, Now there was a certain man of Ramatham Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. An Ephraimite. Verse 2, he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. In these first five verses, we're introduced to Elkanah, the husband of Hannah. He has two wives. Penina, she is, is able to have many children, sons and daughters. But Hannah is barren. The Lord had closed her womb, we find in verse 5. But notice, starting in verse 6, one of the first characteristics we find in Hannah. Her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Now throughout verses 1 through 7 and through the rest of chapter 1 and into chapter 2, not once does Hannah respond to being provoked. Despite the fact that Penina is apparently constantly, every year, provoking her severely to make her miserable, but then every year when they go up to make this offering to the Lord, that Penina provokes her. And so Hannah we weeps and does not eat because it disturbs her that she's not able to bear children for her husband where Penina is. Even though we know that Elkanah loves her, apparently he loves her more than Penina, he gives her a double portion of sacrifice unto the Lord. But not once do we see Hannah snap back. Not once do we see Hannah get into a fight with Penina. Not, not once do we see Hannah respond. Instead, Hannah does something else. She turns to the Lord. Starting in verse 8, when El then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. 
And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. So we see Hannah as there in Shiloh, she, uh, after she's, they've had this feast, she goes up and she's praying to the Lord in this place. And she offers up this prayer. Notice she doesn't ask for many children. She doesn't ask for sons and daughters. All she asks in verse 11, if you will give me a male child, give me a male child and I will give him to your service. And no razor shall come upon his head, which would seem to be part of the Nazarite vow. And in verse 12, we find it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now, Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. I don't know how some of you are. Sometimes when I pray, in order to form the words in my head, I have to actually mouth them. Not necessarily say them out loud. But sometimes in order for the words to form in my brain, depending on, on what all's bothering me and whatnot, sometimes I actually have to, to mouth the words. And especially given the distress and the grief that Hannah's in, that seems to be what's happening here. As she's forming the words in her heart and in her mind to pray to the Lord, she's mouthing them, but she's not speaking them. And Eli notices this. And we find in verse 13, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, verse 14, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Notice Hannah's response and what she's saying that she's doing. She's pouring her, her soul out, verse 15, before the Lord. She's bearing all of her sorrows, all of her grief, her complaint. All of it is going before God. And then in verse 17, Eli has no idea. As far as we know, Eli has no idea what it was she prayed for. And it doesn't sound like they have a conversation where she explains what the situation is. According to what we have, what's recorded for us is that after she says she's made this, this uh, complaint before the Lord, she's offered or poured her soul before or heart out before the Lord. Verse 17, Eli says, go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And in verse 18, she said, let your maidservant find favor. In your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Now, notice not only the fact that when she was in great distress and great grief, she went to God. She poured her soul out to the Lord. She told him of her cares, of her worries. But then Eli makes this statement. He says, in verse 17, the look, God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. Now whether or not that was binding, uh, obviously God did grant the petition that she asked. But whether or not it was because of, of Eli's words here or simply because, as we know, God remembered Hannah, which we'll find in just a moment. Regardless, Hannah trusted that God would hear her petition. And notice we find there in verse 18, her face was no longer sad. She put her trust in the Lord and she put her trust in Eli. She offered up this prayer before God and she went her way. So we find starting in verse 19, they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew, his, knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. 
So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up. For she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. There's a couple things we want to notice here. That as Samuel is born, Remember verse 11, what the promise of, of Hannah was? She said that she would, if, if God would give her a male child, she made this vow before the Lord, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And so then in verse 22, what does she say? After I have weaned him, I will take him up that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. Hannah's not making excuses. She's not trying to buy time so that she can spend more time with her son. She's weaning him, and then after that, she knows full well what's going to happen. She's going to take her son, and he's going to be there in the service of the Lord from that point on. Starting in verse 24, notice what else we find. When she had weaned him, she took him up with her. It's interesting that we're not told that the husband goes or that the other wife or the whole family goes. It's just her and Samuel. She took him up with her with three bulls, one ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord for this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worship the Lord there. When Hannah made a promise, she made a vow to the Lord. Even before she was with child, God answered her prayer. He remembered her, we're told. And so she fulfills her side of the thing. She says, as the Lord has given me this child, I will give this child to the Lord. I will lend him to God in the service of the Lord in Shiloh. And that's exactly what she does. But she does it personally. And, and to me, there has to be some some importance there that she doesn't go up with her husband or with the rest of the family she on her own takes her son because this wasn't a vow made by her husband this wasn't a vow made by her family this was a vow made by her so she takes her son she takes a sacrifice she delivers the sacrifice and the son to the lord this is her paying of this vow and so we see how that she fulfilled this promise to the Lord, but in the midst of all of it, notice how many times she references how that God has taken care of her and God has blessed her. She remembered and praised the Lord. Even in the name of Samuel, she praised God. Back in verse 20, when Hannah conceived and bore a son, she called his name Samuel because I have asked for him from the Lord. The name Samuel literally means heard by God. Heard by God. In the very name of Samuel, Hannah praises God for hearing her prayer. We see in verse 27 and in verse 28, what is it that she tells Eli she says, I, for this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted my petition which I have asked of him. The Lord heard me. Therefore, also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. And then what did they do? She didn't grow, go away weeping. 
It says they worshipped the Lord there. Then in chapter 2 and in verse 1, Hannah offers up this prayer to God. It's a prayer of thanks. It's a prayer of acknowledgement of the power of Jehovah. Now, we're not going to read the whole prayer, but notice just the first two verses of this prayer. Hannah prayed, chapter 2, verse 1, and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. She goes on to describe the power of the Lord and the exaltation of the humble. But then as we go to verse 18, this is the final part that we read that has anything to do with Hannah. We find the love that even though she has given him to the Lord and it sounds like she's not able to spend very much time with him because he's in the service of the Lord at the house of the Lord in Shiloh. We see the love that Hannah continues to have for her child. Verse 18 of chapter 2. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifices. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. And they would go to their own home. And we find in verse 21 that even though the initial request was just for a male child that she could then turn around and give back to the Lord. Verse 21, the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Part of this is sweet, verse 19, a part of it is heartbreaking. That every year, his mother would make him a little robe and would bring it with her, with the family. When they came to worship at Shiloh, she would bring him this little robe. And it just speaks to the care and the love and the remembrance of Hannah for not only her son, but for God who blessed her with him. And then the fact that Hannah then conceived more children, five more at least, we're told, three sons and two daughters, for at least a total of six when you include Samuel. We have an example in Hannah that is one that even though there's not a lot mentioned about her, we have enough to recognize that this woman was a woman of faith, of trust in the Lord, of obedience to the law, the sacrifices that were offered, of deep thankfulness and gratitude to God for the blessing of Samuel. She never took it upon herself to then, at least we have no record, of her kind of making a mockery of Penina's provoking her all this time. And now look, I've got all these kids. We don't see that from Hannah. Instead, Hannah, while seemingly relatively quiet in person, she is strong in heart. Strong in faith. This example of Hannah gives us several characteristics that not only should we as those of us who are mothers, those of us who are grandmothers or aunts to look at, but also for all of us as servants of God. Because we can see not only in people like Moses and David the deep faith and the willingness to obey God in those examples, but examples like Hannah. To trust in the Lord when we pray to Him and give Him our worries and our cares. To be controlled and not provoked when people are attempting to provoke us. To remember and praise the Lord when He gives us great blessings, which He has. 
And to remember that God's blessing in children, grandchildren, nephews, nieces, in being examples for these little ones isn't a burden and shouldn't be viewed as a burden. It is a great gift and blessing from the Lord and one that we should all, men, women, mothers, fathers, grandparents, being an example to these little ones should be something we take very seriously. To teach these little ones how they should grow up in the Lord and trust in Him. The last passage I want to consider with you this morning as we close is in Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23, notice the words of the wise man starting in verse 24. Proverbs 23, starting in verse 24, what the wise man says. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He who begets a wise child will delight in him. Let your father and your mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. But notice... This is in a contrast earlier in chapter 23 to those who bring pain to their parents. And the importance that the wise man places here in verse 25, let her who bore you rejoice, it's based on one that is wise and one who is righteous. One who seeks to serve God and to do all that God has commanded him to do. That is how a father and a mother can be glad. That is how her, she who bore us can rejoice, as, as the wise man says. We offer an invitation this morning to those who are not Christians. To hear the warning of the wise man regarding being wise and righteous versus being foolish and wicked. To hear the word of the Lord resound over the course of the last 2,000 years in the warning from Paul at Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17 that in times past, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has appointed a day in he, which he will judge the living and the dead. And he has given a guarantee that that day will come by raising Jesus from the dead. One day we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we will give it an answer for the things that we have done in the body, whether good or bad. Are we willing to come to the Lord this morning and say, have thine own way, Lord? Are we willing to let God mold us in what he wants? Not to resist not to make ourselves what we want to be. And God, you're just going to have to be happy with what I give you. That's not how Hannah approached it. She bore her soul. She poured out her soul before the Lord. And then when she made a promise, she committed herself to that promise. And she kept it. She didn't attempt to renegotiate. She didn't attempt to try to change things. Well, for those of us who are Christians... When we are baptized into Christ Jesus, not only is it beginning this path of obedience to God, not only are we washed clean of our sins and added to the body of Christ, but from that point on, we are saying, I am here to live for Christ. We can't attempt, after we become Christians, to then change what it means to be a Christian. To say, you know what, I know God tells me that this is what I'm supposed to do, but I want what I want, and I'm going to do what I want. That's not what people like Hannah did. And it's not what David or Moses did. They understood that when God issued a commandment, He meant for us to obey. Can you come this morning and say, have thine own way, Lord? If so, come forward as we stand and as we sing.